Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Come on, stand up. We're going to start things off a little bit slower this morning than normal. Come on and stand up and let's, let's worship the Lord together this morning.
heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have been Good morning. Welcome to Three Rivers Church. We're so glad you're here today. If you're visiting with us, we have a communication card. We'd love for you to fill that out so we know how to get connected to you. Church family, we're glad you're here too. If you feel left out, you can always fill out a communication card as well. On the back side, I want to remind you that there's a vast expanse, plenty of space for you to put prayer requests, uh, praise, things that you're excited about. And we'd like to know how to how to connect with you. You can put that in the offering plate there in the back of the uh, sanctuary. Also, there is a uh, mail slot box. And uh, we know that we're in South Georgia because we have a unique thing that happens every spring. The leaves fall out of the trees in the spring. That just seems so backwards. So I'm gonna have you get up and greet each other today. <laughs> and I need you to just. I'm going to help you out. Either you've raked your leaves, you have not raked your leaves, or you have no leaves to rake because you've got no trees in your yard. So figure out which one it is, and somewhere along the way, find out someone's name and say hello and good morning. So go ahead and stand up to your feet and greet each other. I have not raked my leaves. <laughs> as we're getting ready to get back to worship uh, there was another option that came up in the conversation and that was uh, I mow them just chop them up real small and maybe they'll just become part of the ground another option is you could uh, reach out and have someone come do it for you, you could pay them listen, uh, we're here for one reason today I mean, uh, I'm glad you, we have fellowship that's hugely important, but we're here to worship Jesus Christ. We're, we gather here today because we have given our lives to Jesus, and we want to know how to follow him better each day. And we get equipped today. We get to worship. So as we are looking at the songs, and we're looking at the lyrics, we're, we're proclaiming those to God, singing about God. And sometimes we'll catch ourselves proclaiming something that's not true of our life. And in that moment, we can say, God, forgive me. I, that's not true, but help me to make it true this week. So we're excited that you're here today, but we're more excited that you're here to worship Jesus with us. One voice, praising him, remembering no matter what season you're in, whether it's a season where you got leaves falling in the spring, uh, or whether it's a season that uh, is bitterly cold like the winter, it's a season, and God will see you through every season. Amen? Father, we come before you. Lord, we give you thanks. Lord, that we get to so freely come together and worship. 
Father, that you've given us the church that we have people to grow with, to lean on, to be encouraged by, to be set straight by. Lord, people that love us and care for us, that will be with us through every season. And what connects us and unites us is you, Jesus, the Son of God, our Savior and our Lord. Lord, may we worship you well today. May we dig into your word and grow closer to you today and leave this place and go out into the world that you love so much that you gave your only son for. And may we love them the same and give our lives to them a living sacrifice, witnesses of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
worth more Who could ever come close No thing can compare You're a living hope Your presence, Lord I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free And my shame is undone presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what I Oh. 
cross that you would lay down your crown. Surrender your throne in heaven so that I could be found. And how awesome is this love that conquered the grave. It's a love that can move the mountains, yet it knows me by name. Oh, and it's unbreakable. It's undeniable. Church, nothing will ever separate us. Oh Lord, your love is higher than the skies up above. Your love is wider than what I can dream of. Your love is deeper, it's the greatest of all, the greatest of all.
morning again we had a deep discussion there whether I had enough time to go back and get a bottle of water and I did are you ready to get in the word good because the word is ready to get in you whether you're ready or not we're going to be in Philippians again this week we're going to be there you can actually cheat code you can be there ready to roll if you're not already so go ahead and open your Bibles up we're in Philippians chapter 1 we'll be looking at verses 21 through 26 in uh, Galatians, we said that we have salvation in Christ alone and nothing else is required. In Philippians, we're getting this theme that we have joy in Christ alone and nothing else is required. Last week, Pastor Zane walked us through the middle of chapter 1, and uh, Zane said that we have a choice. How do we respond to the things of this world? Our attitude is a choice. Joy, real joy, can only be found in Christ. Zane said there are really two kinds of mindsets. I need certain things to be happy. That means my happiness is dependent upon other people, and circumstances, and things. Or I need nothing to feel joy because the inside that Christ has changed impacts the outside. God's work for us began on the cross. God's work in us began when we first believed, and God's work is enabled in us through the Holy Spirit. Zane also uh, shared that Paul understood bad circumstances may be necessary to advance the gospel. Zane also sang for us several times, which makes me anxious because I'm trying to recap, and I don't want to sing in front of you. But he said... We have heard the joyful sound. And that got stuck in my head all week. My wife can tell you, like, why are you singing that? I'm like, I've heard a joyful sound. I, I got to sing it. Today we're going to continue we're, in our study. We're going to be in verses 21 through 26. And as I'm getting ready to uh, dig in, I've got to tell you that it's so strange to preach. Um, I look in the room as we're worshiping, and there are so many interactions I've had with people in this room. Uh, I have my wife. She can tell you exactly 
who I am. She's known me since I was 17 years old. But I have to preach before her. She knows me well. My son is here today. We got several kids here from uh, college uh, for spring break. We're glad that they're here. Um, Camden can tell you all about dad. He can tell you all the shortfalls and shortcomings. He can say, Dad, you preach this, but you live this. He'll hold me accountable. And uh, I've got a young man here this morning, Carter. Don't want to embarrass you, but I, I met Carter outside of my classroom. I noticed that Carter was kicked out of the classroom daily. And he kind of reminded me of myself as a kid. So uh, we decided, I just said, hey, if you're going to be out here every day, we might as well get to know each other. I walked over, shook his hand, and we'd have daily chats. And then the next year, he got to be in my class. And we already knew each other. And, and I don't know what he got in trouble for because he was perfect in my class. Never got in trouble. Uh, maybe that's because I could relate to him. Uh, he just had a lot of energy. Uh, that's not a problem. We just directed it in a good, purposeful way. Uh, run laps around the room and send you on breaks and whatever you need. But there are so many different people in this room that when I get up to preach to you, it humbles me to the core that God would use me in any capacity. But I know, and I need all of us to know this, that we're just vessels. The, the good that will come out today has nothing to do with the vessel. It's what's contained in that vessel. And God can use anyone for, for any purpose but he alone will be glorified today. Amen? Amen. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 says, for, me, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. This scripture just from, we don't even have an intro, it's right to the meat of the matter. For me, for to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. That is a profound statement. It's a simple statement, but it is deeply profound. And this is a statement that should not be uttered unless it is true. The verses we will read today are not verses that we simply jot some notes down about. Or we go, oh, that, that's good, I, I need to consider that. The verses we read today will demand a response from you. Paul says that to live is Christ. If I am alive, if I have breath in my lungs, I'm alive for Jesus. We talked about this in Sunday school today, and it's something I've shared in our men's group, but it's something I've been convicted of. We wake up in the morning and we should say, Lord, what would you have me do today? Lord, how may I honor you today? Lord, how can I glorify you today? Lord, how can I be a living sacrifice for you today? If I am alive, it's all about Jesus Christ. Living is Christ. We have been made, we've been made alive in him. In Colossians 2, verse 13, it says, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. In Galatians 2, 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. This verse is absolute nonsense to the world. Makes no sense. The world would say, to live is me, and to die is loss. 
But Paul says something that defies the logic of the world. Our life, our being, our purpose, our essence, our very identity, everything that we are is Christ. That's either a true statement for us or it's not a true statement. That's not a kind of statement. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And that living hope is Jesus. In Jesus we have an inheritance. And it's imperishable. It's undefiled and it is unfading. And it confounds the world that our life would be driven by a love for Jesus. It makes no sense at all. But Peter says it well in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8-9. through 9, He says, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We've never seen Jesus, but we love him. Man, that's got to confuse the world. We've never seen Jesus, but our belief in him causes us to rejoice with a joy that is so great that it's in, inexpressible and filled with glory. There's been a few times in my life when I've been filled with joy that's so tremendous that strange noises come out of my throat that I didn't choose. Silly laugh, I can't even describe it. Have you ever experienced that? One of those was when my first child was born. Amazing. I've been filled with joy, but this is a whole never, another level of joy. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. How can death be a gain? Again, this runs completely against the wisdom of the world. The world says YOLO. If you don't know YOLO, that's, that's good. It means you're not in the world. You only live once. But we believe and know that we actually live twice. We live once in this body. We live again in a resurrected body and become like Christ. Death is gain because only through death can we ever see our Lord. Have you ever thought, of the moment that you get to see Jesus face to face. I got a call this morning from uh, one of my employees, and she was devastated. And she says, Dr. Lang, I just found out my mom died. And she fell apart just saying those words. And I've been there. When you, try, when you just put reality into words, just that alone breaks you down. And I said, I am so sorry. And she said, but it's okay. She knew Jesus. Late in her life, in her 80s, she came to know Jesus and gave her life to him. I was like, well, I know you're down at the Players' Championship today, and you're going to feel like this is going to ruin your whole day. But I want you to enjoy yourself today. And every beautiful thing, smile, because you know your mom is with Jesus and every beautiful thing think of all the wonderful sweet memories you have with your mom today it's a day for rejoicing 
mourn you will but you're going to rejoice a lot more than you mourn today was a day that her mom saw jesus face to face but have you thought of the moment when you see jesus face to face do me a favor and let's do something together now it's going to feel a little hokey but that's okay close your eyes you can bow your head if you need to but close your eyes don't be the rebellious one like i'm keeping my eyes open because something crazy is fixing to happen just close your eyes try to remove all the distractions that can fill your mind and thoughts you find yourself in heaven there is lush green plant life all around you everywhere you look the quantity and the quality of the flowers and their colors and their design is absolutely breathtaking as you're taking all this in you can't help but notice an enormous sparkling city in the distance it's so large it stretches as high as you can see brilliantly radiating a pure wondrous light and as you're taking in the sounds and the beauty it's then that you begin to notice all the people around you family loved ones dear friends heroes of the faith the great cloud of witnesses that you've read about you're now a part of your heart is exploding with joy unimaginable then there's a hand that touches your shoulder and the touch is like no other you've ever felt the simple touch has the power of all the warm embraces you've ever felt and known in your entire life then you slowly turn and you see before you a smiling face it's a face that you've never seen before but a face that you've always known and you hear and know deep within you at the same time these words well done good and faithful servant you can open your eyes we don't reflect on that enough do we when we are driven to live a life for Christ that profound statement that Paul makes can be true but there's so many things that distract us from that simple beautiful truth that we just took the time to reflect on and when you have that before you it makes the things of this world grow strangely dim to live as Christ and to die as gain in death we are removed from worldly troubles in death we we're removed from the daily drudgery of life in death we are removed from physical pain and the decay of our bodies in death we're given a new life we're resurrected while in this body we live in christ and we live for christ in death we get to live with christ and we will live with him forever Colossians 3, the beginning of that chapter says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And study and preparing I read this statement it said if you're not ready to die then you're not ready to live we have to make certain of our eternal destiny our men are reading through a, a Bible study and in Job this week I read where Job made this following proclamation among his friends who were just beating him down in Job 19, 25, it says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. 
Job had strong faith, as should we. He believed that no matter how bad his life got, no matter how awful it, it was, that God would never leave him or forsake him, and he would see his Redeemer face to face. Paul continues in verse 22, and Paul says, If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm glad that Paul is so honest with us when he writes. It helps us understand that we're not alone. That in Romans, he talks about how he struggles with doing what is right, and he knows what's wrong, but he still yearns to do what's wrong, even though he yearns to do what's right, and what a, a messed up mind he, he must have. But we see this kind of back and forth. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. We need a purpose for living that is greater than ourselves. We need a purpose for living that goes beyond just providing for our physical needs. Why are you here? What is your purpose for being alive? I think this is probably the most challenging thing that happens when a child transitions from being under the roof of their parents and being on their own. They start having this deep philosophical question, why am I here? What is my purpose? What am I useful for? What am I going to spend my whole life doing? And it can be very depressing because if you don't have an immediate answer, you, you may feel like and be confused and think that your life is without purpose. Sometimes we look at people who are much older than us and we go, well, they clearly know their purpose. And all the older people in the room can laugh because you're like, I remember being there, not knowing my purpose. And what I try to teach people in their 20s is this, your purpose is, is to be useful every single day of your life, to apply yourself to something that is good. But beyond that, as a follower of Jesus Christ, our purpose is simply to serve the Lord. And here's something that should give you great peace. There will never be a day that you open your eyes and take in a breath that God is not at the ready to give you his will. The purpose that you have is to serve the Lord and to enjoy him fully. And that will satisfy you more than any other purpose you can imagine or create. I loved coaching football. That was not my purpose. That's not what I was born for. It was fun. It was impactful. I got to really impact the lives of young men. But that was not my purpose. That's just something I did for a handful of years. Sometimes we get so mixed up because the world's got us convinced that our purpose is attached to all these different things and our identity gets attached to that. And if something changes, then we feel like we've lost our identity. Good news. If you put your life in Jesus Christ, your identity is eternal. You're a child of God. You're a servant of the Most High God. You are friends with God. That doesn't even seem right to say, does it? Jesus says, I count you as my friend. We're friends, family. We are in great standing. But if you don't know what your purpose is, and if you don't know that your purpose is greater than just yourself, you'll find yourself with depression and anxiety and frustration because anything that changes in your life can set you off course i remember one time watching this football player and they were giving testimonies and it was a fellowship of christian athletes video and he's a professional football player and he just had a devastating leg injury and one of his teammates is giving their testimony and he's going to visit and he goes i'm going to visit this this man i look up to and uh i don't even want to go visit him because i don't know what to say because his career is over his joy his passion is over and i'm trying to think of how to be positive and how i can encourage him he goes and i walk into the room and he's in the hospital bed and he's smiling and he's the most cheerful looking person i've ever met and i'm like how are you doing he goes man i'm great i'm excited 
I'm curious. I don't know what God's up to, but he's up to something because he's just changed my life direction, and I can't wait to see what he's up to. And this young man said, I went to encourage him, and he encouraged me. Not only did he encourage me, but his faith was so strong and so amazing that it made me say, I need what he's got because my life would be over if I had an injury and his life has just begun I, I don't understand his mindset so through that mindset this young man gave his life to Jesus Christ isn't that amazing we have to understand that God has given us a grand purpose and it's much grander than what you think because God created you unique. You're the only version of you that will ever exist. Completely unique. And he's given you a specific purpose and assignment for a specific time and place that involves you. And he wants you to do that. Isn't that profoundly amazing? And don't measure the grandness of it on human scale. Because if you bring one person to Jesus Christ through your life, you've impacted eternity for one person. Paul says, if I'm alive, I've got work to do. I must labor for the gospel. I must be fruitful. And Paul is caught between desire and duty. Paul is... In the ultimate win-win situation he's able to see life and death as equally valuable but one is valuable for him and the other is valuable for others if Paul is alive it means fruitful labor I have lived a blessed life I've had the pleasure of seeing the impact of my life on those around me it's one it's one of the things that an educator sees that that many people don't get to see educators have been a coach a pastor these people play vital roles in the lives of others and I've had the pleasure to be all of these and to see lives change and this room there are people in this room that have grown in their relationship in Jesus because of my fruitful labor my simple obedience to a glorious Savior has impacted lives and that blows my mind because I am nobody and nothing and sad a wretched man that's what I would describe myself as a worm I agree with those great hymnals and in this room are people that have grown in Christ because of your fruitful labor there are those in this room who know Christ because they knew you and were impacted by you and your life and the impact of your life in Christ will go far beyond those in this room. As long as God gives us breath in our lungs, he has equipped us with all we need to proclaim his glory. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Paul knew that the only reason to remain in this world was to bring souls to Jesus Christ and to build up believers so that they could do the same. The most significant thing you will ever accomplish in your life is to bring someone to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's nothing more purposeful or significant you will ever do. This is not just fruit of your life. It's eternal fruit. And it's a fruit that can go on and bear more fruit itself. Scripture describes three categories or three kinds of spiritual fruit. We have spiritual attitudes that characterize a spirit-led believer, the fruits of the spirit. We have righteous actions, 
and we have new converts. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. Fruitful labor includes all of these because they all work together. If I do not have spiritual attitudes, the fruit of the Holy Spirit inside of me, how can I share a message of hope? There are some people that share the gospel and the, there seems to be no love, no joy, no fruit of the Spirit in them at all. They've got truth and nothing else. Did you know that it matters how you speak to people? I know you know that because you, bless you, you get upset when you go through a drive through and someone is rude to you that you've never even seen or met. Can I help you? I might go somewhere else. If I'm not living out good works, how does anyone know that my belief in Jesus is sincere? I can't just convert people to Christ. I have to live for Christ each day. And I have to live in Christ each day. And all of these things together or what Paul is describing as fruitful labor. It's just not the conversion of souls. It's, it's living a life in Christ and showing the fruits of someone that has given their life to Christ. We labor every day, but is our labor fruitful? The world will convince us that our labor is fruitful. But we often labor for ourselves. Even our fruitful labor in this life yields fruit that perishes. We labor for things that we build, things that we make, things that we do, but all these things will one day perish. We're in a season right now that we call spring. You ever heard of spring cleaning? I bet most of you have a long list of things to do outside of your house and inside of your house that you've been waiting for spring to do. You know what's very frustrating is it doesn't matter how many times you cut your grass. Do you know what happens? It grows right back. You, you meticulously go through and pull every single weed, they come right back. This morning as we were going to walk the dogs, I saw these aggravating things that I call vines coming up out the ground. They have like little hands ready to clasp on things. And they grow quicker than my motivation is to pull them. Because I noticed them this morning. I didn't stop and pull them this morning. I give it a couple days, they'll be attached to something, intertwined in something, developing some good thorns, just melt into you, the flesh of your hand as you go to try to pull them unless you're smart and wear gloves even then they'll get you if you're not careful there's fruitful labor there's things that we do in this lifetime but it has nothing to do with eternal things this church building that we work so hard to maintain and keep in good working order will not exist for all eternity these wonderful chairs that are cushioning you right now, as you said, will perish. This beautiful carpet that matches the chairs will perish. The home that you have so many memories in will perish. The very body that you're in, the physical body you're in will perish, will breathe its last. So if you put a lot of work into working out and staying healthy, in an instant, you go from healthy to unhealthy. Even the most healthy person will breathe their last breath. But there are things that do not perish. And God has called us to be about that work. And Paul knows that he's got fruitful labor. In verse 23, he continues and he says, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. I am hard-pressed. The Greek word 
gives us an image of a traveler on a very narrow path that's surrounded by a high rock wall on either side and it kind of forces his direction there's no other options it made me think about being on my grandparents farm when they were trying to get the cows which i learned aren't very bright animals into the place where they need to be to to feed or back in the day it was a dairy farm where they would go and milk the cows and it starts wide and just funnels them in and they get in some point when they can't go any other way but that direction they can't turn around Paul is torn between desire and duty and I think we will often find ourselves in this situation although Paul's desire is to be with Christ which is good often our desires are off track this is why when we are serving others we grow so much more in our faith when we follow our desires and put them as a priority we quickly find ourselves in trouble and out of line with God's will in our life we had a great discussion in Sunday school this morning free plug for Sunday school you're missing out on some some good stuff we have a lot of good Sunday school classes going on a lot of good discussion a lot of uh, good people that have taken time to teach and prepare but in Sunday school this morning we were talking about this this mindset what keeps us from serving others what keeps us from making others more important than ourselves as we look at the lit, the week ahead of us and we prioritize that if we're honest most of our priorities have to do with us and our well-being and what we need to to get by and then if we can squeeze some time in for others we'll squeeze that in but if we can't squeeze the time in for others they just have to understand when we grow in christ we find that our pure earnest desire is to be with christ forever but as we grow in christ we know that it is our duty to make sure others know christ forever and Paul desires in his heart to be with Jesus right now, but he can hear these words in his mind, I'm sure. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus does not tell his disciples to stay with him. He doesn't tell us to stay with him. Jesus says, go. Jesus says, make disciples. Jesus says, baptize them teach them teach them to observe all i've commanded you and jesus says you will receive the power to do this power from the holy spirit we will be witnesses to the entire world paul concludes that remaining in the flesh is more necessary paul yielded his personal desire to be with the lord for the necessity of building up the church. I commend Paul. His sincere desire is to be with Christ. But I think we can get off track very quickly. I don't know if we have the sincerity in our relationship with Jesus Christ. An easy way to understand relationships is just to look at the relationships that you currently have. What makes you really close to someone? Is it not the time that you spend with them? I did something really, really sad this past week on Friday. As a principal of the school, I have to determine what grade level teachers will teach in next year. 
Now, if I let teachers pick which grade level they are in next year, they would make these decisions based on who they like, who they get along with, that they've already got the whole grade prepared and mapped out, and it's a very easy road for them. But I have to look at the goals of the school and how a teacher fits into that plan and that purpose and that vision. So as they were learning what grade level they were going to be assigned to the next year, some of them were filled with inexpressible joy and some not so much. But here's something that I know. When they start spending time with each other as a new grade level, they're going to grow and bond because they're going to be going through the process of learning the content and the curriculum and the students and the parents together and that struggle together is going to make them really really close and this time next year they're going to say don't separate us but had I not done that the year before they wouldn't have grown close to new people we kind of do that in our own lives don't we God everything's good do not uproot me do not change anything this is just where I need to be but it's not about us and the primary relationship that supersedes all other relationships is our relationship with Jesus Christ and you simply can't grow close to Jesus unless you spend time with him and I mean quality time I've shared with this before, but can you imagine if I came home to my sweet wife and said, hey, listen, Marcia, you're a priority. You're number one in my life, and I've set aside the next five minutes with you, and you're going to have my full devotion for the next five minutes. I've got a pre-scripted, written-out thing that I'm going to read, and then I'm going to say, have a great day. Thank you, and I'm going to feel really good about myself, and we're just going to move on. Do you think she would feel close to me? probably not she knows when i love her the most because i spend time with her because it takes away from other things hey i was gonna do it but you know what let me put that aside you've got my full attention right now kids know when mom and dad love them because mom and dad take things and put them to the side and give time and energy and effort to that relationship People know when you love and care about them because you give them your time, your energy, you listen. I give a lot of marriage counseling, and one of the first things we talk about is listening. And you'll hear things, well, I listen, but they don't listen. Listening really is a moment when you die to yourself and say, I've got comments, I've got opinions, I've got things I want to say, but I'm going to refrain from those because I just want to hear you. I don't care if I agree with you or disagree with you, I just want to hear you. I'm going to listen to you. I was trying to teach my son a, a life skill. I said, if you love your wife, you're going to have to listen and there's going to be times when your wife's going to come home from a rough day and she's going to want to share with you her day and how frustrating it was how hard it was and deep within you you're going to want to start providing her with solutions and answers to because you're going to feel bad for her that she's endured such a bad situation you're going to know well if you just did this if you did that why don't you try this but buddy that is not what she wants to hear matter of fact she doesn't want to hear anything from you she just wants to vent to you she wants to put emotional baggage on you and you are your duty is just to listen don't provide a solution unless they ask for it and just say sweetheart i'm so sorry that you had that day that sounds awful and it's gonna be the hardest thing you ever did all the men in the room are refraining from talking, but everything in a man is to fix things. This was bad. Oh, I can tell you why that's bad. Let me help you do that. And you make it worse. When you have a relationship, 
you spend time and you listen see if we're not careful we have quiet time with the lord but it's not quiet time it's loud time we tell god all our needs all our hopes all our dreams all you need to do and we forget to be still and hear the silent quiet still voice of god that gives us clear direction Paul continues, verse 25 says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul understood, and he understood so deeply that he was convinced that he would remain and continue. Now, he's not a prophet. But he knows that he's going to remain and continue, not for Paul's sake, but for their progress and joy in the faith. For your progress and joy in the faith. When we grow up in our faith, when we make progress in our faith, we truly begin to experience joy like we've never experienced it before. And Paul understands the assignment. Although he desires to hit the fast forward button and to be with Christ, now there's work to do. There's fruitful labor that is necessary. There is progress that must be made. You have an enemy, in case you didn't know it. The devil, Satan. You have an enemy who has spent a great deal of time trying to convince you that it is okay for you to be immature in the faith. Not a big deal. Others can be mature in the faith. They can do great things. I'm just immature in the faith. I'm just a baby Christian, and it's fine. It's not hurting anything. That's a lie. The enemy tries to convince you that it is fine if you're not growing spiritually. Others can do that. That's not me. I, I'm not that spiritual person. That's a lie. The enemy tries to convince you that it is fine, it's just fine for you to wander around in this life without purpose or conviction. And that is a lie. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade God others but what we are is known to god and i hope is also known to your conscience for the love of christ controls us because we have concluded this that one has died for all therefore all have died and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are ambassadors for Christ. God makes his appeal through us. In Christ, God has made reconciliation possible. In Luke chapter 5, we read that one day as Jesus was standing by the lake, of Gennesaret the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God he saw at the water's edge two boats 
left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and his companions, all of them, were astonished at the catch they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. They left everything and followed Jesus. And what calls Peter to do this? What caused him to put the nets, even though he was convinced that it was a complete waste of time? It was simply because you say so. All Jesus needs from us is simple faith. Why are you doing what you, Jesus, you said so? I don't care how crazy it sounds, how much I don't understand it, how much I've tried before and it didn't work. If you say so, I do it. They left everything and followed Jesus. What have we left to follow Jesus? For us to live as Christ and to die as gain. Do not leave here today without that being true in your life. Some of us may have gotten off track and we can't speak these words in truth. We live for ourselves and hope that Jesus is just okay with that. We live for ourselves and we, we hope others may have that special thing to live for Christ. We live for ourselves because we've been deceived. And I want to encourage you, if that's you, to take care of that this morning, right where you are. Be honest with God. Just be honest with Him. Where relationships are filled with honesty and conversation and listening. Be honest with God and just confess to Him what you've done and where you are. He knows. Be honest with God and repent. Not just confess, repent. Turn from it. Say, God, this has not been true in my life, but it's going to be true. Will you help me to make that true in my life? I want to utter those words and they be true. And let God know your heart's desire this morning is to speak these words in truth. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. I desire Jesus more than life. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never put your faith in Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. In Romans, Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved you can call on the name of the lord jesus right now and you'll be saved every believer in this room is able to talk with you to help you understand 
how to give your life to Jesus, and how to follow Jesus daily. May everyone here today be able to proclaim, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Father, we come before you. Lord, this room is filled full of believers that have set their heart, their faith, and their trust in Jesus Christ. And Father, like all relationships, if we're not careful, things fall apart. Lord, thankfully, on your side, Jesus will never leave or forsake us. But Father, sometimes we struggle on our side of the relationship. Father, and Paul shared such strong, true, profound words that we want to be true in our life. And Father, right now, if we've fallen short, we just, we fall before you. We just confess to you. Lord, I've put other things in front of you. For me to live was me. For me to live was my things, my possessions. For me to live was just other things. And Father, I repent from that. And I want this to be true in my life. I want for me to live as Christ. I want that to be the strongest reality in my life. I want it to be so true that I don't even have to speak it. It's known by all who are around me. It's known in my words. It's known in my actions. It's known in my lifestyle. It's known in my passions and the things that I'm concerned about. And Father, there may be here today that are not believers. There may be someone this morning that has never trusted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that right now, to the best that they understand, with their pure, earnest heart, they would say, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. Lord Jesus, I trust you. Father, help us to be ready with these new baby Christians that have given their life to Jesus. Help us to be ready to faithfully walk with them and to guide them and to teach them and to help them grow as we grow. But Father, may, be, may we be faithful in growing in our relationship so that we're able to help and to teach and understand or we'll be useless. And Father, we thank you sincerely that we have hope, that we have Christ that we have salvation. Lord, we thank you that this world is not all that there is, that there's eternity with you. Lord, we thank you that as we try to imagine what it's like, as hard as it is, that one day we will see you face to face. Lord, that we will look at you in your eyes and we will know the face that we've never known. But Lord, until then, may we live for you richly and grandly and in such a way that it draws others to you through our simple, humble faith and the love that we have for you. And what drives the love for, for you and us is that you loved us first. And you loved us so much that you gave your life for us. And Father, if you gave your life for us, so we give our life for you, a living sacrifice that seeks to honor you and glorify you everything we do and in every day that you provide for us and with the simple breath that you put in our lungs may we use that to proclaim you as lord as savior the name above all names the name to which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that jesus is lord may we confess that strongly and richly now not when it's too late it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
quick seat, just a couple of quick announcements. Next Saturday, March 23rd at 8 o'clock, our men's prayer breakfast is happening. And don't forget uh, Grief Share on Monday nights, along with our men to men, women to women, and of course our regular stuff that goes out throughout the week. Uh, Holy Week is the week before Easter, which is uh, Easter is March 31st this year. So Holy Week services will be each Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday before Easter. On March 26th, we will be providing lunch during that time on Tuesday, March 26th. We need 60 sandwiches, 60 desserts, and four gallons of soup. Uh, If you need more information, want to volunteer, please see Pastor Zane. Each service begins at 12 o'clock, right? 12 o'clock, it will only be an hour, guaranteed one hour, so that you can go there during lunch and still make it back to work on time. So we'll be providing lunch. It's a service and lunch Monday through Friday. We'll be providing lunch on Tuesday, the 26th. Again, 60 sandwiches, 60 desserts, four gallons of soup. Please see Pastor Zane. Also, in your uh, current, there is a volunteer opportunity for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes that Mark mentioned this morning. They are having a triathlon on April the 20th. There's more information in the current. If you want to see how you can help with that, please check out the current. Any other news? We are in daylight savings time. Has everybody made the adjustment? The dumbest thing, one of the dumbest things Americans do, change the clocks. Oh, Nick, thank you. Uh, don't forget also, uh, we're, are we still needing some eggs? We still need eggs and some candy. Uh, we hit our goal, I guess, about Right, so we are sponsoring an egg hunt at Crooked River Elementary on Thursday the 28th uh, from 5 to 7. So we're collecting eggs, uh, plastic eggs and candy, not chocolate. Just drop the chocolate off at my office. But uh, hard candy uh, that can stuff the eggs. And then there'll be an egg stuffing party on next Sunday during youth at 5 o'clock. So if you want to volunteer for that, please see Nicholas Piljay, and he will be glad to give you all the info you need. I think that's it. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful to be here. Lord, thank you for the message out of Philippians. Lord, what a great study that we are, uh, that we are just picking up steam now in. Lord, I pray that we would take everything that we've heard, Lord, knowing that we can have a new life in Christ. So, Lord, let's take everything that we've learned here today, leave this place to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ, missionaries for the gospel. Let us be doers of God's word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen.